All right, so I got most of the plumbing roughed in here. So remember, I'm going to have a washing machine here. It's a stackable washer and dryer. So for the washer, the weir of the trap needs to be at least six inches off the ground, no more than 18 inches off the ground. And then for the standpipe, that needs to be a minimum of 18 inches and a maximum of 42 inches from the weir to the top of the standpipe. That's just so that if there's suds from the soap, it doesn't foam up and overflow. So in New York State here, we're on the IPC, that's an international plumbing code. We're not on the UPC, which is a universal plumbing code. So I know this looks weird here, but this is the vent for the kitchen sink. And then that is the vanity for the bathroom. I kind of made a mistake when I was piping in the vanity. I was gonna wet vent the washing machine, but then I realized that that would be an S-trap and that's not allowed. So I came up with two inch pipe and then I'm converting it to inch and a half here and bringing my vent up, which would be like a wet vent, but I can't do that because that would make an S-trap right there. So I had to revent that into the main vent here. And this is not ideal to have a vent going around a corner like that, which is kind of why I wanted to wet vent it, but I just wasn't thinking enough ahead. But it's not a big deal. There's no problem with having two inch pipe coming up for the vanity. It's just a little bit overkill. And it was a little bit harder to fit it in here. Normally, I wouldn't have even thought about it. I would have just shot right up with the vent like I did there and just shot up to the ceiling and met up with everything else. But being that there's a beam right there and that we gotta get around that somehow, I thought it would be better just to try to wet vent it, but that wasn't gonna happen. So I ended up going over here, meeting up with this vent, which is venting the toilet and the tub. So basically I have the bathroom, the washing machine, and the kitchen sink vented on one inch and a half vent. And under the IPC, if you add all this up and the kitchen sink, that's nine DFUs, drainage fixture units. And with the IPC, you're allowed to be up to 10 when you're on an inch and a half vent. So I'm good on that. I have another vent over here that I'm gonna go up and out the roof. That's for the basement bathroom, as well as the sump pump. And by sump pump, I mean the one that's in the floor that drains the waste out of the downstairs bathroom because where I'm exiting the building is higher than the floor. So basically the bathroom pumps it into the sump pit and then from there it goes out. It's an injection pump. So that's totally separate. So I need to run that up and out there. I have a knockout on the roof for it. And so it's inch and a half until it gets there and then it needs to be converted to three inch going out the roof. Same thing with this one. Everything connects together and then it goes to there and then I need to make it to the roof over there and then right where it goes out the roof it needs to be converted to three inch. It needs to be converted to three inch at least 12 inches below the roof surface. So like I mentioned in my earlier videos I like to do the plumbing and electric at the same time and one of the reasons I like to do that is for efficiency because a lot of times like with plumbing especially there's always like one little fitting that you need or just one thing that you need from the store so anytime I come to that point, I'll switch to the electric or vice versa. If I'm doing the electric and there's one little thing I need, then I'll switch to the plumbing. It's more plumbing that you need to go back and forth for. I'm pretty stocked up on fittings, but sometimes you just need something from the store. And rather than go to the store for one little thing, you just switch to the electric. So it's going to be a little bit back and forth in this video because I started out doing the electric, I started setting the boxes and I ran out of boxes, so then I had to switch to the plumbing. So now I got more boxes, now I did the plumbing and I need some, some more pipe. So I'm gonna switch back to the electric. So downstairs here in that little chase area, little soffit area type thing, we got the washing machine coming out, two inch pipe, and then, like I said, I got the two inch pipe coming out from the vanity, which didn't need to be, but then we also got the inch and a half pipe coming over from the kitchen sink, that's the vent for that. So you can do that where you join up a two inch pipe from the washing machine into two inch pipe here. You don't need to bring three inch pipe out. And you check the DFUs for that. But then we got the main stack here, 
and I just got a branch off to the tub, but I don't have the tub yet, and I don't have the alcove framed up for the tub, so I didn't put that in yet. So that's pretty much the last thing I need to do, and then I just need to connect the stack down into the basement. But I think what I'm gonna do for now is just bring my inch and a half pipe over, cap that off there, bring this pipe almost to the floor, cap it off there, put a test plug there, and basically what that's gonna do is allow me, it's like a balloon that goes inside the pipe, and that's gonna allow me to test everything that I have so far. So then I can have the building inspector come over, he can inspect my plumbing from basically there up, and the way we would do that, once I'm done with everything here, I connect this down, connect that over, and then connect the vents through the roof. Basically at that point, I can go up on the roof and either fill the vent right up to the top with water and check for leaks, or I have a test fitting that goes on this stack here for three inch pipe, and it has a little port on it where you can hook up a hose and fill it up from the bottom here. So either one is acceptable, you can do either way. And then that way, everything from here up is tested and inspected, and then I can move on and get my electrical inspected, which will kind of happen at the same time. And then I can start putting wall coverings on the first and second floor, everything on the first and second floor. And once I'm pretty wrapped up with the first and second floor, with finishing it, then I'll go in the basement, I'll make all my connections there, get another plumbing inspection down there, get another electrical inspection down there. Because right now the basement, I'm kind of using it to hang out and stuff, so I'm not trying to disturb all that right now. Uh, once the upstairs is mostly done, then we can get on that all at once. And at that point, everything up here will be pretty much finished. So then up here can be my hangout spot. And then, you know, we'll, it's, so, it's, it's a couple extra inspections, but it's not a big deal. So I'm gonna get back to the electric and I'll frame in the alcove for the tub there and we'll get this thing rocking and rolling.
take all the home runs for upstairs right here. There's going to be seven different wires going through here. So I need to make it so that everything comes over here and then up and around. So I know that there's going to be a lot of wires here. So I'm going to put some stackers here. Same thing here. And then it's going to come up and around. Another stacker. Another stacker. Because I know ahead of time that there's going to be a lot of cables going through there. I also know that from that point to the basement in the panel is 40 feet. So what we're doing is just running everything out 40 feet from there and dropping it down. That way I'll deal with everything below that later. I just ran out of wire on my spool that was a thousand feet. So I got a couple of these laying around. I'm gonna use these up. I don't really like using these because it twists the wire a lot. But since we're gonna be running out 40 feet, we can untwist it. And sometimes I'll put that on the spool instead of buying a thousand feet because a thousand feet is like $650. So. If I have a few of these laying around, I'll just use them up.
concerned about is how I'm running the wires because it, it almost seems like it almost seems like the top and bottom don't really matter. It's the sides that matter. You want the sides to be tight. But the top and bottom, it seems like you need some slack to be able to put the wires in, especially like that. Mm. It almost seems like what we should do is just take this, take a real marker. Yeah, I was looking for one of those. It almost seems like you also want to hit the side of one of these so that you can screw it in. Because mm. that's what these are for, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it almost seems like... go either way. It almost seems like what we want is like this. Like that. Just wanted to be super snug. Right there. I'm going to start up here. Those little uh, thingies. Like I need to keep these out. doesn't go in anything and neither will the other one that's just all right show it again so last year I had bought a bunch of these boxes thinking that these were going to be the go-to thing for this ICF wall to put these outlets in but now I'm seeing that these are not that great, and I don't think it's really the company's fault. I don't know if there's a whole lot you can do, but I had to channel out this so that the wire can come out the side, which is, I don't have to do that all the time. It's just on this one, because I need to drop down and then go over underneath this window. Normally you would just drop down with both of the wires from the top or from the bottom. So that's not an issue, but the hooks don't catch anything now that I have this channeled out here. The other problem though is the fact that when you have a wire pulled through, it makes the clamp pop out, 
which makes it so you can't put these little things going in because the clamp is out and it's in the way. So it's almost like you gotta put this in the wall and then run the wires to it, but you really can't do that. You gotta put the wires in at the same time you're putting the box in. So being that these are pretty expensive, I think these are $10 a piece versus a regular box that you put in, 18 cubic inch, that's $1.50. The other thing I don't like about these is the fact that they're almost an eighth inch thick on this flange right here. It's between a sixteenth and an eighth inch thick, and it's gonna make your sheetrock bulge out there. I don't like that either. So there's a lot of things I don't like about these, and like I said, I'm not really knocking the company, because I don't really know if there's a whole lot you could do. I can't think of anything else that they could do to make this better. I just think that I have like another 10 of these, and I'm not gonna use them. I'll save these for another time. I'm just gonna go back to the way I was doing it downstairs with the regular 18 cubic inch boxes because it's just a struggle to get this in here. And now this side isn't even attached anyways, so I gotta foam that in anyways. If these weren't so expensive, I probably would get a bunch of them and then I'll just foam them in. But even that is not that great because this flange extends up here too, so it's really hard to get the foam in unless like down here, you can't even get foam down there because this extends past there. So I'm not sure if I'd really even use these even if they were like free or the same price as the other boxes. I just don't think they worked out that great. So I'm just gonna go ahead and put the 18 cubic inch boxes in. Do it like I was doing before. It just seems a lot easier.
All right, so today is one of the warmest days it's been in a long time. So I'm gonna put these vents through the roof here. So I need to continue this over to about there. I'm gonna dig that knockout out first to know exactly where that is. And then I'll figure out my route to get to here. That fitting is just on there so I didn't get any kind of like debris in there. I know roughly where that knockout is. I just don't know exactly. So I'm gonna just dig around in there for it, get the hole punched through there first and then I can put it through. So I think what I'm going to do is work backwards on this. I'm going to stick this through the roof, get it perfectly plumbed up. It's about six inches longer than it needs to be, but I can always cut it down. I want about two feet sticking up above the roof line. So I'm going to put that in there. I'm going to put the boot on. I'm going to actually foam around it with the Great Stuff Expanding Foam to hold it right in place so it's perfectly plumb. And then I'll run my inch and a half vent up to it and connect it after the foam is dried and it's set in place. That way I'm not worried about getting it perfectly plumb after I have it plumbed into the vent line. Cause at that point it might be too late and I definitely want this to be plumb. So I'm gonna use this boot to put over this vent pipe, three inch, and this is adjustable all the way down to like quarter inch or something.
So now that's all foamed in, let that cure for a little while. And then once it's solid, I'll connect the rest of it. That way I know nothing's gonna change on the top. It's perfectly plumb on the top. And no matter what happens here, nothing's gonna change up there. Plus it gives it a little bit of insulating value too because I took away a lot of that insulation. Once this cures, I'll fill in the rest of this and fill it in all flush to here. So it's all solid closed cell foam right to the edge here. So it's sticking below the ceiling, but that doesn't matter because I'm going to put more insulation on the ceiling. So these forms are only an R23 and we need an R49. So originally I was going to use two pieces of 2 inch XPS, which some of them are up to R13 for 2 inches. So two of them together would be fine. But I got pricing it out and it's like crazy expensive for that kind of insulation. So I think I'm gonna use Roxel, which I'm not unhappy about switching to anyways, because Roxel is fireproof, whereas XPS is not. 
Actually, XPS is pretty flammable. It's much more flammable than this EPS. It almost burst into flames. So I'm actually kind of glad that I'm making a switch. So I'm probably going to end up coming down with like six inches of Roxel, which would leave plenty of room for this. So we're going to need to make like some rafters in here, kind of like faux rafters, just to hold the insulation. I was going to need to do that with the XPS too, so it doesn't really change anything there. Uh, the only difference is it's going to be like six inches instead of four inches. But either way, I'm only sticking down like two inches here, so, or, or not even, so it'll be perfectly fine. So instead of the bathroom fan being on the ceiling like it normally is, I'm going to actually mount it on that wall. I'm going to see if I can mount it right up there. That's one of the highest points up there so it'll get the moisture better. But if it doesn't fit, I'll put it right there, that's fine too. This will be another one of those spots where I can store stuff up there too. Stuff that's really not needed that often. And also it's like a utility area so that my bathroom fan, the duct for it can come out over to there and then hit that beam and then go over there into that room where it's gonna hit the ERV, the energy recovery ventilator. Most of the time those ERVs are capable of taking the bath fan. I haven't done the research yet, so I'm not exactly 100% sure, but if for some reason I can't run it into there, then I'll just have to core drill out right there in the gable end and just shoot out that way. So all my drain pipes and vent pipes are done from this point up to the roof. Everything is done and ready to be tested. So the last thing I need to do is add a small section to go down to about here and then I'm going to put a clean out that's going to be accessible if you pull out the refrigerator there's going to be an access panel right there and there will be a clean out so that you can clean out up or down and this needs to all be boxed out but before I do that I'm going to add this small section here and I'm going to put this flush clean out here. And the reason I'm going to put a flush one in there, first of all, is you can bend the snake around easier. But second of all, I'm going to use this as a test point. And so I'll put this balloon test port in here. And basically what this does is it, it screws into here. And then the balloon will expand when you put air in. You put pressure in there, up to 35 pounds of pressure. It'll expand that little balloon and it'll close up this area. And once that's closed up, you can test everything from there up. And this one also has a fill port right here where you hook a garden hose up to it. And it's got a little check valve so it can't go backwards into the garden hose. So you can either go up to the top on the roof and fill up the vents with a garden hose. Or you can just fill it up from here and just wait for it to come out the top. And so you, you just put this in here. You test it out. You bring the inspector over, show them that there's no leaks, and then you're good to go. And then you can take this out and just put a plug in here. And then that becomes your clean out, which, like I said, it'll be on the inside. It'll be kind of angled this way because this stud is in the way from it being directly like this. So we'll angle it like that, which is no big deal. I'll put a little access panel here around the sheetrock. That way, if I ever need to clean it out, it's easy. Just pull out the refrigerator and clean it out. So if you're ever doing any serious amount of plumbing, or any amount of plumbing at all, really, this tool is worth getting. Definitely get yourself one of these. This reams out the pipe from inch and a half all the way up to four inch pipe. It reams it out on the outside. Just put it in there. It's got the perfect, I think it's 15 degrees. You can barely even see it, but it's, it's chamfered on there. And it just takes a few seconds and that's it. It's done.
The whole idea is if you don't do this, it'll push the glue into the joint instead of actually letting it go on the side. Another tool that I would highly recommend is one of these. If you can see the part number on there. It's made by Milwaukee and you want to get like two or three of these because they're pretty easy to lose because it's the size of a pencil. And basically this just reams the inside of the pipe out. And you don't have to do that for the vent pipes. But for any drain pipe, you definitely want to make sure that it's chamfered out. Because otherwise, as hair and toilet paper and stuff is going down this pipe, if that's a sharp edge, it could catch on there and then it'll hold things up. It's especially true when you're using a pipe that's going horizontal. Vertically, it probably doesn't matter too much, but you should just do all the pipes like that. Another little trick is to take your glue and primer and tape them together like this. Most people think that's just to keep them together so you don't lose them and they're not separate, but really what this does is it balances it better. It gives it twice the amount of surface area so that it's, it's a lot harder to tip over. I've tipped over one of these primer canisters and that's not fun. So I got this all boxed out now. I got a clamp on here. I don't know if that exactly passes code, but this is a conduit strap. According to everything that I've seen for the code, this should pass for the code for a strap. It's not metal and it's bigger than three quarters of an inch wide. So it should be fine. It holds it really tight in place. You can't rotate it and you can't make it go up or down at all. So it's definitely doing its job. So I'm gonna go ahead and test this system. Put this in here. You wanna make sure the arrows are pointing up. Because the way you fill it, there's a little groove on the top that has to be going upward. So like I said, 35 pounds of air. So I actually forgot that you need a double female end on your hose. So it doesn't work. I could probably find one somewhere around here, but it's easy enough just to switch to bringing this hose up on the roof and just filling up the vent. All right, let's start filling this up. The bad thing about filling it up up here is that you can't see if there's any leaks. So I'm just gonna let that run. I'm going to go downstairs and make sure nothing's leaking.
So you can definitely hear it's filling up. That three inch pipe takes a lot of water to fill it up. But I want to fill it all the way up until it starts coming out the vent pipe. I'm just check everywhere for leaks as I'm doing it. Believe it or not, it's very easy to have a leak in these pipes. You might not ever know it until you fill it up. Most people think a vent pipe isn't important anyways. Just don't put any primer on there. Don't worry about it. Don't chamfer it. But the truth is, when you go to do the test, you'll find out. You can kind of hear where the water is too. I think it's right about here right now. See down here you can't really hear anything so I think it's filled up to this point. Now it's starting to fill up that whole area. And I got a leak right here. That was leaking right there, but that's no big deal. That's just a test cap. All right, so I filled this system mostly up to the top with water. I couldn't stop the drip from happening here. What I'm thinking is there was some sort of debris or dust in there, which was making it not seal right. The problem is, is it was dripping down and it was dripping down all over here. And then I couldn't tell if there was something leaking down there or not because the water was just dripping down and I couldn't. So as far as I can tell, nothing leaks except for that part, which like I said, doesn't even matter because that's just a test plug. And once you take that out, there's gonna be a standpipe in there, which is open anyways. It can leak out there, but it should never leak out there anyways. I checked everything else. I didn't see any other leaks. So I'm pretty satisfied that nothing is leaking, but I did depressurize the system. I emptied out all the water just because I don't want that dripping all over the place and I want to see what's going on with that. That way when the inspector comes to inspect it, that's not leaking. And I can see if those pipes right underneath there are leaking as well. I don't think they are, but I couldn't really tell because it just was so wet from that leaking. So normally when you're testing these out, that would be going all the way down into the basement and then out of the house. And usually you put this piece on where it exits the house or switches to the four inch pipe. And then that way, when you're done testing it, all you got to do is let the air out of this and then the water just comes rushing out and it goes into your septic system. But in this case, I had to empty it into a five gallon bucket, which it took like one and a half five gallon buckets worth of water to go all the way up to the top, which I was surprised. I thought it would have been a lot more than that. But like I said, this is sort of the test run. This is not the actual inspection. I'm gonna do that just before the inspector gets here. I don't wanna have it pressurized for a few days just because it's like getting below freezing at night and I don't want the vent pipe up top to freeze because the water needs to go all the way up to the top. So I don't want it to sit there frozen. So I wanted to get a little bit more done before I ended this video, but it is getting pretty long. There was a lot of stuff I had to cover in this video. I didn't really have to cover it, but I thought it would be important to cover it because a lot of people don't know most of these codes between electric and plumbing. This is something I put in there, but I didn't show it. This is actually UF wire. This is a 10-3. And believe it or not, it was actually a lot cheaper for that than it was to get the regular 10-3 indoor wire. It is a lot harder to work with this, but it's perfectly safe and legal to have it inside of the house. So there's still some stuff that I need to do to get an inspection, both electrical and plumbing. And I'm gonna get the framing inspection at the same time as the plumbing, but that's already done. So obviously there's still some work that I need to do with the supply lines. I need to run supply lines to the bathtub, the toilet, the vanity, the washer. 
as well as the kitchen sink downstairs. I need to run all the supply lines for that. So I'm gonna cover that in the next video. I'm also gonna put an insert in here for the dryer. It's a recessed insert so that you can put the dryer duct inside the wall and I'm gonna hard line it up and around and then I'm gonna core drill out over there for that. It's just one of these little pans right here. I also need to splice all my wires, get all the neutrals hooked up, splice the grounds, get that ready for electrical inspection. The inspectors definitely want to see that. I used to be able to get away with not doing that, but they like to see that anymore. And up on the ceiling, I didn't install any of the lights just because I'm going to be coming down six inches with some framing. So I need to get all that done with the insulation before I can set any of these lights. But the inspectors don't really care about that because the lights are all accessible after you sheetrock. So they're okay with the wires hanging down just the way they are right here. All you gotta do is tell them you're doing like a remodel box, which is fine for new construction, because there's really not a lot of other options that you have for these smaller lights. Basically the option is a remodel version of the lights, but there's really not much you can do about it. That's the only way they really make them. They do make some that go in between joists, but it's a lot more complicated and not a lot of companies even make them. So once the sheetrock is up, all you have to do is pull that light out and then the box is accessible. So if the inspector wants to see how you splice something inside of the box, he can easily just pull that down and check it, which is why you can get away with doing this instead of actually running the lights. I still gotta run some lights. I'm gonna run two lights over the shower there and then I'm gonna have my vent fan for the bathroom right there. The code for the smoke detectors is that you need one in every bedroom and then you need one in the hallway immediately outside of the bedroom. So that's my smoke detector outside of the bedrooms. That's one for in this bedroom. That's one for in this bedroom. And then that's one for in this bedroom. And you're allowed to have them on the wall as long as they're no more than 12 inches down from the ceiling. And what I like to do is use a bridgeable wireless smoke detector. So what I did here was I connected these all with three wire. I connected them all together with three wire up to this one right here. And this one receives the power. So this one will give the power to all the other ones. But then it doesn't have three wire going from there downstairs because I'm going to get a wireless one that goes from here and connects wirelessly to the one downstairs. That way I don't have to run three wire downstairs. I just use one wireless one here and one wireless one downstairs and this bridges those. So then from this one, it signals all these other ones through the three wire. That's the red wire that you have in there that connects all them together. That's the communication wire. So when you're going between floors, especially on a remodel, those wireless smoke detectors are really nice because they make it a bridge mode. So not only does this one communicate with the one downstairs, but it sends a signal from this one to all these other ones, so it bridges it. So one thing that is kind of a gray area in the electrical code, the NEC, is when you have a lot of wires going through one spot, you're supposed to derate wires when they're bunched together and they stay together for more than 18 inches coming out of a fire stop. So it's it's kind of a little bit complicated, but this area here, I had to foam it in as a fire stop because it's between floors. So if you kept these together, you can have no more than four cable assemblies together before you have to derate them. And actually, you have to derate them even with less wires than that, but the derating doesn't matter because when you do the calculations, the wires are still able to carry what they're supposed to carry. It's just that after four wires together, you're supposed to derate them to a point where they no longer have the capacity that they're supposed to. So the way to get around that is to not have them together except for when you absolutely need to. So this spot right here has six wires going down and each one of them has two current carrying conductors in them. So if I was to keep these together coming up to here, then I would need to derate them. But see, that's why I kind of separated them. I kept three over here, three over here, and I kept them apart until they get up here. And they kind of join together here, but that's not going to be considered a spot that they have to derate. 
Like if you tied them together with cable ties from there up to here, then I would have to derate them to a point where they don't carry the proper current that they're supposed to. And then I would have to lower the breaker on them, which I guess is another option too, but they don't really make 10 amp breakers, so that's not really an option. So from what I'm reading in the code, this only applies to where you're going through some place that has a fire stop like that. Once you're going horizontal like this, that doesn't need a fire stop. So you could, in theory, tie all of them together in this one channel right here. As far as I can read anyways, it's kind of complicated. But it really depends on what the inspector considers bunching together. And I don't want to take any chances with that. So places like this where they're bunched together, but they have these stackers. These stackers provide an eighth of an inch of space between them, so that's not considered bunching because there's like six or seven of them right here, but that's not considered bunching. And you're not going through a fire stop, so it's also not considered something that you have to derate anyways. So you can see I got a lot of cables here in one spot. It's just how I had to do it because all the power came from here and then it's gonna disperse from there. I've had inspectors tell me that there's almost never a time when you need to derate these cables. It's, it's a very special circumstance. But then I've had other inspectors that say, no, you, you got to derate them if you have them more than 18 inches together. And really all that means is that you can't have them bunched together with a cable tie. You'd have to kind of like space them out, put a couple of them one way and then a couple of them the other way. And then like cable tie them separately. So it's really not a big deal but it is something to look out for when you're trying to bring a whole bunch of cables through one spot. So these are the wires coming from upstairs. They go through that channel there, and then they go around through that beam. And on that beam, there's like six of them together, but they have the stackers on them, so it shouldn't really matter. Plus, this is not a fire stop area. Fire stops are vertically, they're not horizontally, unless there's like a garage next door or something. So, but just in case, I bunched up three of them together and then the other three together so that they're not like bunched all together up. Go over here and I put little blocks in there that I Gorilla glued in and I put the stackers on and then they come down here. And now you got a whole bunch of them going vertically, but they're all on stackers. So they can't consider that bunching because the stackers give them an eighth of an inch of space between them. So it's not considered bunching. So in the main kitchen area here, some of these wires, they're doubled up and some might even have three wires in one channel. So the code is that you need to be an inch and a quarter away from the surface. So some of these are not. So any of them that are not are marked with the blue tape. And what I'm gonna do is go through and take 16 gauge steel or 16 inch steel. And that's the minimum size that's required for a nail guard. And I just cut strips out that are inch and a half and I'll just Gorilla glue them right to the wall like this to cover these spots. So you can see there's quite a few of them. So I got a couple four by eight sheets of 16 gauge steel. I'll cut them all with the skill saw, inch and a half wide, and we'll just slap them on there with the Gorilla glue. And then that way everything is protected so that you don't hit it with a screw when you're putting on the sheetrock. So upstairs, I made sure that every single area that was channeled was deep enough. I didn't have to run two wires in the wall anywhere. So I channeled it out deep enough where I don't have to worry about nail guards because it's an inch and a half away from the surface. But down here, I still need to do a bunch of work and that'll be in the next video. You gotta make sure you put nail guards on all these studs too, even where it goes through a block like that. That's not required because that's not a main spot that you're gonna put a sheetrock screw, but I like to put them in there anyways. But you gotta make sure you got all those on. The inspectors really like to see those for both the plumbing and the electric. If it's for electric, it needs to be an inch and a quarter away from the surface. So the hole needs to be an inch and a quarter away from the surface. So normally I do uh, either a three quarter inch hole or a seven eighths inch hole. Because if you do a one inch hole, you have to be exactly in the center of the stud. So if you do like a seven eighths inch hole, you've got a little bit of wiggle room. And if you only need to put like one or two wires through, a three quarter inch hole is good enough. And then you got quite a bit of wiggle room. But an inch and a quarter is for the electrical code. For anything else, 
it pertains to the building code and that needs to be an inch away from the surface. So for pipes or anything else that you would need to go through besides electric, it needs to be an inch away from the surface for the building code. Or you put a nail guard on. And none of these walls are load bearing, so the notching and boring doesn't really apply to these. You could pretty much notch out or bore out anything you want because it's not load bearing. If it was load bearing, you would need to like double up this stud right here because it just doesn't leave enough room and it makes it weak. But in this case, nothing is load bearing up here, so I don't have to worry about that. So as far as the staples go, I usually make a rule that if two wires need to go together, you use a staple. If there's three or more, you put a stacker there. So there's some spots that I needed to use a stacker that look like overkill, like this spot right here. It's only got three wires, but anything more than two. You could put two staples next to each other, but it doesn't look that great. Kind of looks unprofessional, so you just put a stacker there, three or more. But anything with just two wires, you just put a staple there, you're good to go. I didn't record it, but I installed the vent all the way up to the roof. Did the same exact thing as on the other side. It's actually symmetrical. It's the same exact distance from the edge and the top. So both of them are in the same exact spot, left and right. They're like a mirror image. So I think that's it for this video. I'm not quite as far as I want it to be, but I'm getting there. And I'm almost ready to get inspections. Probably another week and I'll have everything all completely done and then I'll be sheet rocking. So in the next video, we'll be just finishing up those last few things, getting inspections. I'll let you guys know how it went. And then after that, we'll be sheet rocking. And I'm also working on some other videos in the meantime. I got a few that are gonna come out in a few days with some other stuff, because I've been doing a lot of work here and, and it's getting kind of repetitive just being in this house working all the time. So I've been working on a few other things. I just need to finish them up. So I'll see you guys on some of those videos.